Back a few months ago, um, we had our own meeting at Xamarin. So this is an event we do every year at Xamarin, where the idea is that we basically bring the entire company together in one place. And we use this time to define in the year to come what we're going to achieve, what we're going to do with the product, with the company. And so this year, it happened that we went to Orlando, Florida. And so as someone like me who has never been to a theme park before, obviously the next step when you are in Orlando is to go to Disneyland. And this is what I did. This is a picture of me and my team, the iOS designer team, when we went to the Magic Kingdom. And so of course you have all the fun you want in all the Disneyland theme park, that's what they're here for. But I was also excited for another reason, because there is not only the theme park in Orlando, there is something else. There is Disney Animation Studio. This is one of the buildings, one of Disney Animation Building. Uh, this is the team that just finished the latest uh, feature film that's going to come out in, uh, for Christmas, probably. And I don't know, but I love Disney. I've always been in love with Disney. Um, every time a new Disney movie would come out, my mother would always either bring me to the cinema directly or just purchase it on VHS or any medium that was there at the time. And so I grew up, I grew up on those movies. And I'm sure I'm not the only one because the common trait of every Disney movie, beyond, of course, a great storyline, is just the quality, the, the general feeling of quality that came from all those movies. Uh, things like the character design, the walk on expression for each of those characters, and obviously the great, great animation that came of those, of those guys. And this is not a random fact. As Walt Disney himself tell, animation can explain whatever the mind, the, the mind of man can conceive. This facility makes it the most versatile and explicit means of communication yet device. So this was always something that was very important to Walt Disney himself. And Disney was actually so much on the cutting edge of this animation business that a couple of the animators, two animators actually, uh, from the early days, uh, Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston, condensed all that knowledge, all the, the, the techniques that they had at Disney into a book called Disney Animation, The Illusion of Life. So this is a rare book at this stage because this book came out in the 60s, 70s, and so it's very hard today to find it in print. But it's still a great book. It has a lot of content, even for someone who is not necessarily interested in animation itself, but even someone who's just interested in the story of Disney. Uh, it has a lot of like, photos and pictures of the early days, things they used to do, or they used to interview um, actors, or they used to convert all the photos into actual animation, et cetera, et cetera, all the, the, the ideas that Walt had. What's also interesting is that in this book, they also did, um, define and outline all the techniques that they had and what made Disney animation something that stand out in the landscape at the time. And they condensed that into 12 principles that I hold here. Things like anticipations, question stretched, exaggeration, appeal arcs, there's a lot of them. But anyway, at this stage, we are a couple of minutes into the talk. Uh, so if I was at your place, I'm in a mobile conference. And you know, as much as I like Disney, like the other guy, and I could, tend, you know, I could st be sitting there all day long listening to this guy talk about Disney, what am I doing here? This is a mobile conference. I should be hearing about mobile topics. Well, don't worry too much because the same, in the same way that Walt Disney at the time, in the same way that Walt Disney at the time was tasked with bringing those characters to life, I think as mobile developers today, we also have the same task into bringing our mobile apps to life. Of course, things are different a little bit because the medium has evolved and we're not limited anymore to just hand drawn paper, keyframe animation style of things. We have much more control over what we do. But at the end of the day, we have the same job. Our job is to instill life into content. And so I'm not the only one to say this. And if you actually go over all the major manufacturer, um, uh, mobile, mobile OS maker guidelines, you're going to find this theme all over the place. Things like bring life to the experience. This is in a Windows guideline. Real objects are more fun than buttons. This is the Android design guideline. And in iOS 7, we also find a mention of strive for realism and credibility in your animation. So this is a theme that is all over the place. And so as I said, this is not where we're kind of more uh, in our time compared to what Walt Disney had. 
when he was doing his animation work. And so, because this is a phone, and if you have been to uh, Frank Kruger talk about augmented reality, um, if, you have been, if you have been using the Carbon Me Axe and all those kind of new things that comes out, you know that we have much more things that are now available for us to craft our experiences. Things like, obviously, animation, things like touch, multi-touch, uh, sensors, where is where all the cowboy goodness kind of comes from, voice, the advance of Siri, the advance of Google Now with voice control, and even physics. This is a little known fact, but in iOS 7, there is an entire physics engine baked into the platform that you guys can use to model real life uh, physics effect. This is what Miguel used on stage on the keynote uh, to demonstrate Slappy Salmon, a game that you probably all love, right? But of course, this being a talk with me, uh, if you have seen my work, you know I'm a fanboy, I'm interested so much in animation. So of course this is what I'm gonna focus today on. So just to make sure we're on the same page, uh, let's do a quick recap. Well, what are animation exactly? What are animation at the core foundation? Well, animation is essentially the idea that a system has two states, a starting state and an end state. And the animation is when we bring that start state to the end state in a continuous fashion, instead of having a discrete system where we just go from the start state to the end state. And so there's a couple of different frameworks. Uh, there's a lot of them, actually. But every major platform has its own. It would be silly in this day and age to have any platform coming out without an animation system. So on Windows, we have storyboards. Uh, on Android, we have a couple of them. But the latest one is Object Animators. This is the one that you should use. And on iOS, the same way, but we have animation blocks. So they all have different names. But at the end of the day, it's the same base system. You have an animate call, or whatever you want to call it. You pass in a property. So in a previous example where I showed the three cubes, I was animating, animating three different properties. I was animating things like translation, rotation, scale. There's, of course, a lot more. Then you specify values, maybe two. That's the base, because you want to animate a state change, so you need at least two, but you may have more. You specify a duration, how much time we're going to spend to go from the first state to the second state. Then you have a delay. Maybe you don't want to start the emanation right now, but just wait on something else. And finally, there is that guy, the interpolator. This is the guy that we're going to focus on today, because this is the one that is, among all those other parameters, this is the one that is the most interesting. So again, interpolators, each platform has it in some way or another. They have different name. Uh, on Windows, it's called an iising function. On Android, it's called an I time interpolator. And on iOS, it's called a CI media timing function. CA for uh, core animation. But again, it's all the same thing. No matter, what they wanna, no matter how much they want to convince you they are better, it's all the same thing. It all boils down to this, a single method call that is usually called interpolate. And this method is always the same. It takes one parameter, a double, and returns another double. The parameter that you're given is something that the animation system is going to give you is a normalized time attribute. So remember when I showed you the animate call, there was a duration parameter. So this value can be anything, can be as little as maybe 10 milliseconds. Well, 10 milliseconds would be really little, but let's say 100 milliseconds. But it can span in the Quest app, for instance, we have a continuous animation on the Android version uh, where the circle that you see slowly animate between different states. So this is a very long running animation. I think we set it up to 10 seconds. So if you wanted to do a general purpose interpolation method, you couldn't really depend on any duration, specific duration. So what the system is going to do is that it's going to take this duration and then normalize it onto a scale from 0 to 1. And the idea is that when you're given the value of 0, this is the start of the movement. When you're given the value of 1, this is the end of the movement. And so what interpolates give you is the ability to take in that information and do whatever you want with it. And that's what the value you return. If you return 0, that means you are at the start of the motion, at the, the, the first parameter that you gave into the animate function. If you're at one, that means you reach the end, the final value of your animation. So this is a method, but the good thing about animators, uh, interpolators, as I said, is that they have very simple definition. So it's very easy to graph them. And this is a more visual way to, to see them. So here, I have played two curves. These are the standard curves used by pretty much everybody to represent a deceleration, which is a movement that starts very fast and then goes slow to the end value, and an acceleration, so something that goes slower at the beginning and then reaches the ends faster. 
And so you can see why those two guys are called deceleration and acceleration, because if we go at the half time, so when the animation is at, at its half time, if we look at the deceleration curve, we can see that it reached almost already, at that time it already reached almost the end. There is not too much to go to reach the final state. But if you look at the acceleration, this is a much, much thinner slope, and we are still very much close to where we started. On the contrary, if I look at the other side, so the other part of the half time, on the deceleration side, I'm gonna have to know to go very slowly to the end point, whereas on the acceleration side, I'm going super fast to my final value. They still reach the same end state, but they do it in two different, very different ways. And those curves don't come from anywhere. They are actually a representation of a mathematical expression, here a quadratic expression, and this doesn't come from anywhere. This is actually a clear representation of the equation of movement from physics. And so if you have a modern animation system, you are able to use directly those equations to model real life movement into your apps. And I say every modern uh, animation system, but there is also a fallback if you're using like <coughs> iOS. Uh, where you can use also cubic Bezier, for instance, to represent the same kind of movement. I wish I always had like a better system. But the core idea here that I want to give you is that thanks to those interpolators, you can craft any type, any type of movements you want. And just to give you an idea, this is one of the default interpolators that is in also pretty much every animation subsystem. Can you guess what this does? Yeah, me neither. I don't know what this does. So you know what? The best thing is to actually, we are app developers, so let's make an app. Let's actually use an app. Uh, so sorry guys, I'm an Android developer, so I only made this on Android. Uh, you can download this app, it's called Xamagic. You can go to the Play Store right now, it's available there. You can also check out the code, it's on GitHub. And I'm gonna run it for you here. So I'm using our beautiful new Xamarin Android player. Amazing to do, if you want to do any work on animations. All right, so I have an experiment here, I have a map. So just to give you a bit, uh, to maintain a little bit of suspense, let me run something, let me not run the interpolator I wanted to show you, but something else. Okay, this is my experiment. I have a pin, and I want it to go from the top, falling down to the location where we are right now, the I at Regency Hotel. So, what do you think this is gonna do? I mean, if I go back, if I go back to the equation that I showed you here, this seems to have, this seems, there's like those, those eaves here. So they seem to have, it seems like the movement, the movement is actually having several states. And this is a map. What are you used to on a map when a pin falls down? You are used to having this kind of behavior. So let me show you that again. If I zoom a little bit here. The pins drop. So I didn't change anything in the animation, any of the parameters, I didn't change them. I just changed that last parameter, the interpolator. This is the only thing I changed. And so by just changing that, I'm having a very, very different movement. When the pin drops now, instead of just falling back to its end state, it's actually bouncing. And you can see that clearly because, again, you can plot those values. So here in the space of my app, I have a visualization of what the value or the value evolves across time. And you can clearly see all the little arcs here that modelize the bouncing effect. So if I run in slow motion here to exactly, you can exactly see how the value is gonna evolve and how the curves map to the movement exactly. And this is an interpolator. Again, I haven't changed anything else to the other values of the animation. I only changed the interpolator. All right, so back, so remember in the beginning I talked about Disney, I talked about the 12 principle of animation that Disney said. So, just for the sake of the experimentation, we're gonna focus on a couple of those ones. The first one I wanna talk about is anticipation. So anticipation is a principle that actually comes from a long way back. The idea is that before an action, an action, before an action happens, you wanna give, you wanna prepare the mind of the viewer that the action is about to happen. And the reason for this actually stems back all the way from theater, uh, a theater performance, because in a theater, people may actually be a long way back. So they see the actor that are on stage, like me here, they see them from a far distance. So all the stuff that we are used to when we talk to someone, all the body language that we are used to uh, when we do a movement, so when someone is about to run, he has a clear body, move, like body stance that he's about to move. But when you are very far away, you don't really catch those very tiny, subtle changes in the posture. 
So you have to do something. You have to exaggerate. You have to create a first movement that's going to prepare the mind of the viewer that something is about to happen. And you have all seen this. I'm going to do. I'm going to do. You, I'm going to show you what happens generally in cartoons. Before a character is run, if I was to run to the left, the first thing he's going to do is that he's first going to take this kind of stance. And this gives you a clear idea that he's going to run into that direction. Another example, let's say I had like a pocket here, a big pocket, and I want to pick an object from it. Let's say I was on a stage like that, so someone who is viewing me from that angle might not see that I am actually, if I, the next frame, if I have an object in my hand, he doesn't know where it came from. But if I, instead of just taking the object out of my pocket, if I had a very clear motion like this, that I'm about to take it from my pocket and bring it out, this will be a clearer action of what happened. So let's see how we can do anticipation, some kind of inspire ourselves from this concept into our walk into here. So this is a little experiment here. Uh, as you know, James is a big fan of monkeys, so he, he told me, why don't you make a monkey viewer? And so I made a monkey viewer. So this is, here we have a frame here, and I want to load an image dynamically. So this is something you have done, all of you have done multiple times. And so, first of all, I'm going to show a spinner. I'm downloading an image. And then when I finish downloading my image, actually, let me, whoop. I have, I have, so when I have finished downloading my image, instead of just showing the image directly, I'm going to do this kind of motion where first the, the view is going to flip. But instead of flipping all the way, it's going to first have this kind of anticipation movement that's going to tell the user, exactly in the same way I was about to run when I showed you how, when I was about to run, is going to have first a movement in the opposite direction and then go back and then go all the way to the end to show the picture. And so, again, if I move back to like a more normal, uh, the default uh, interpolators that you can ever create, the movement here is just that, just the view flipping over to show the image. The only thing I have changed to make this anticipation movement was to tweak my curve, to tweak my interpolator. So if I go back here, you can see that what the curve is doing is that it's first going to try to go all the way, but then decide, no, I'm not ready yet. I want to go back to another state. So this is modeling this kind of movement. And so what I want you to notice here is that the curve is actually going underneath the zero mark, which means that it's going backward in time. That's why it's going beyond the zero angle. It's going beyond that. And this is entirely possible in, inter in, in, in interpolators. Even though the value that you are given is limited between 0 and 1, the value that you return may not be. And this is an effect that is called undershooting and is used a lot. And then I'm using the same thing after that. After I finish doing my undershooting, then I'm finally transitioning back to my end value, which is the flipping over. All right, so that's anticipation. Another cool effect is question stretch. And squash and stretch is pretty much what characterizes Disney. You have seen all, you've also seen that all the time. Squash and stretch is, also, is used a lot when you have to exaggerate motion, what you have to exaggerate people's expressions. In, in, in cartoons, for instance, when a character wants to describe fear or surprise, generally you're gonna have this kind of animation where the eyes, for instance, are gonna stretch all the way to express a, a, an exaggerated fear. Um, or you also have motion, like here, uh, when something is falling, to exagger exaggerate the fact that the movement is happening, if a ball was to fall, for instance, you're going to first see this kind of stretching of the ball, and then when it hit the ground, this very splashy effect of it compressing and then expanding back. So again, let's see how we could model this kind of effect into our application using solar interpolators. So here I have like a chat app, like you used to. Uh, it has a couple of bubble messages. And so I wanted to find a cool way that I can bring a new message onto the screen. And this is what I did. So if you want to see in slow motion, because it's cooler. So here I have the bubble falling down from an unknown position. And when it hits its final position, I want to apply this squash and stretch effect the same way a ball would fall and compress onto the ground and then spring back to what it was before. Um, like this again, if I want to show again. And what's very interesting in that case, uh, beyond the animation, is that I want you to notice that here, I am not actually going to one like all the other animation. I'm actually falling back to what I was before. This is the idea of springing back into, into the original state. So if I were to pick something else, 
like let's say a quadratic curve, so one of the acceleration curves I showed you, you would see that the item is actually very, very slowly squ squashing and then staying like that. But this is not what I want, I want to spring back. And so again, this is something that is entirely possible. Although most interpolators that you're gonna find all, always bring you back to the end value, always bring you to the end value, nothing prevents you from creating an interpolator yourself that brings you back to the start value. All right, squash and stretch. And so the final principle I wanna show you, because this is the principle that defined the entire reason why interpolators even exist in the first place, is timing. So remember the curves that I chose when I was not showing you what I, the, either the anticipation or the squash and stretch? I was using generally something called linear curve, linear motion. And this is the most simple one. Uh, if you had to see the implementation of an interpolator like that, of a linear interpolator, the only thing it would do is just return its parameter, which create this very straight curve. And so this is what you see at the top. The object here, so the two little cubes are exchanging a big cube. And so if you look at the bottom, there is the keyframes, which are each uh, position, intermediate position of the cube across time. And so in the first version, you can notice that the cube is evenly spaced out. It's always has a very clear and definite position across the timeline. Now if you look at the bottom, the other one is something that is called, is using something called ease in, ease out, which represents both an acceleration at the beginning and a deceleration. And the effect that you have is that there is more frame both at the beginning of the movement and at the end of the movement. And this is normal. This is how we do every movement in our real life. You never just spring directly to the end position. You always have some form, if you are in your car, you always have some form of acceleration when you start from the, the steel movement to getting back to another steel movement. Let's say you are stopping, stopping at a traffic light. You're always gonna have those uh, phenomenon of acceleration and deceleration. And you can see right on the animation, the second movement seems much, much more real. And you can also notice that they have added a bit of squash and stretch. The cube is slightly squashing and stretching to follow the inertia of the cube. So this is, this is uh, principles that go well together, work well together. So let's go back to the first experiment that we did. Because I want to show you exactly how does that translate to an animation. Because again, the theme here is that you never change your animation. Your animation, the animation parameters are always the same. They go from the same value and at the same value and take the same duration. What you change is the interpolator. So let me go back to the first experiment that we had, the pin dropping on the map. So again, if I go back to my default interpolator here, so that was a bit of, a, a bit of fun, this is the bouncing. So now imagining that I wanna do something, so let me show you the linear curve, so that's the most simple curve. Exactly in the same way that I showed you in the animation, when you do something like that, the pin is gonna be just using the same amount of keyframe to go to its final destination. So it seems like a very stiff movement. This is not, this is not what we're used to, and this is, this is a bit mind-boggling when you see that. A more correct representation here, if I wasn't using the bouncing, would be maybe an acceleration. So I'm gonna use a quadratic curve here in that case. And so in that case, the pin is gonna start very slowly and then accelerate to reach its position. And so, still, this is, not, this is not the best way because it seems like it stops right at the end. So it's like it's hitting a wall. Maybe that's not exactly what we want. Maybe we want a pin that has like a parachute. And so in that case, it would fall very fast, but then because of the parachute, it would slow down to its final position. So this is a deceleration curve that we saw earlier. And so in that case, the pin is gonna start very fast, but then slowly reach its final position and then smoothly go on to it. I want to show you like a last, a last uh, example of a power curve. So this is something that inflates the acceleration. And so you're going to see the effect here is that it's almost a slam. So we slam the pin onto the map. So again, this is all to show you that timing, with interpolators, you can create any type of timing you want. And you're not limited to what the system offers you. And so, I showed you in the beginning as I talked about Disney. And if you were in our material design talk from yesterday that I did with James, you may have noticed that it was a two slot session. So we had two sessions back to back. And in the first session, we talked a lot about the visual changes that went into Android L uh, with material design. But the entire, the second session was pretty much entirely dedicated to just motion, just that aspect of motion. And motion and animation are becoming what makes your application look polished when a user has it. It's becoming so important 
that in the material design guidelines, when we went to Google I.O. and people, engineers, were presenting the concept of motion to us, they didn't call themselves designers. They didn't call themselves uh, experience designer, two fields of design we are used to at this stage. They were calling themselves motion designer, which means that the only thing that they do on an app is just to craft the motion of it. This is just to show you how important it is. And so the next time you do an app, or if you're working on an app right now, I always want you to remember at the back of your head the same way that Walt Disney in his time, the same way that Disney was a poster child for great animation because they cared about the quality of their motion. If you give the same amount of detail and attention to motion in your own application today, this is what is going to give you an edge tomorrow when a user install your application. This is going to make the main differentiation between you and all the others. Motion design. Thank you very much. I don't know if you have time for questions. You can also grab me later if you want to talk a bit more about it. Um, as I said, all the codes, like the apps I've shown, is on GitHub. I'm actually going to put back the slide if you want to take it. If anyone has any, has any question in the meantime. I think we're supposed to have a mic, right? Yeah. I guess I can, I can take a question still, probably repeat it. Someone had a question? Well, Mike was faster. Oh. Okay. Uh, but this animation, uh, well, well, I think is uh, animation is pre pretty good. Uh, my usually my concern about animation is uh, performance. I mean, usually the uh, there's uh, f how many frames per seconds, how, how many frames per seconds. Yeah. Uh, you, want, you want to usually target 60 FPS for like a real. Yeah. yeah we, we usually want to 60 while. 30 you is try. acceptable, yeah, but <laughs> uh, the thing is, uh, even sometimes at 30, even when you actually um, have a good uh, performance normally, it becomes uh, much slower in uh, animation mode. And sometimes it just uh, kill the application sometimes. Uh, there can be a more memory and everything. How you manage that? And, well, most animation systems these days, uh, yeah, you used, to be, you used to have to think about that when you were doing it at the time, but all the animation systems that I know today, which, you know, Android, iOS, et cetera, they compensate for that. So when they do, a t when they do an animation frame, and that's why interpolators are, are actually, they are designed to be continuous. As you saw, it was all curves. There was no gap in between. So the idea is that no matter how late you are in your animation, you can always get a value any, at any point. So I agree, the problem is that, so if you miss this frame, that's called frame loss, and that's why you want to try to have 60 FPS, that's the way you can have a, a, a credible motion on the screen. If you start losing frame, then yeah, you're going to have this phenomenon of jumping, which everybody hates. But most animation systems, they, they cope for that, they cope for that lateness, so it's all under for you. So the only job you have to do is, in the case of Android, where the animations, for instance, are run on the main thread, what you have to be really careful of is that you never hug the main thread for anything else. And that, this is the secret to have like a, a, very, a very clear and beautiful animation. Right. So I used to do animations using um, Mac, uh, Adobe Flash. And so there, you're able to create keyframes in a UI editor. Yeah. We, we were so, talking about like just so, two seconds ago, so that's awesome. Yeah, yeah so, so the question was, uh, you know, is this all done pro programmatically setting the keyframes, or is there a uh, third party uh, UI for generating animations for mobile? So this is actually what we were discussing, and we were actually lamenting the fact that I don't think there is a good solution today to do that. So yeah, if anyone wants to do a cool, nice project, here is a cue. I mean, if you know, if you know of some, do tell me, because I would love, I would love to have something like that. Because that's a problem. And I think, well, I think one of the things that we announced, actually, sketches, could be something that could go towards that. Because you have seen, we have those visualizations. The curves that I've showed you are also displayed on sketches. And that's for a good reason, is that we can also test and see exactly what those interpolators do. And so if we manage to merge in, I don't know if you have seen, there is a guy called Brett Victor who has done a talk about that, uh, about how he's able to, to have real-time live um, games, in this case, running. And he's able to tweak precisely all the animation and see them replayed in real time in his talk, in his demos. And that, I wish that sketch. Exactly. I wish. I think Sketch is going to go into that direction. Oh, I 
if it's not going to that direction, trust me, I'm going to push them in that direction. Uh, the samples that you've shown, is that created using the Xamarin forms or it's a native API? It's a native application because this is what I use generally. Okay. So that's what I'm used to. But so, Xamarin forms is also a system that has its own animation. Uh, they also have an animation system. I mean, you are free to use the, the, the platform animation system if you want, but they also have their own animation system, which follows exactly the same line. So the good thing about interpolators um, is that they, they pretty much all, they all, they all are math, essentially. They're just a bunch of multiplication, subtraction, anything like that. So it doesn't matter. And I actually have a project um, I'm not ready yet to announce, but this is my application is actually using it. It's called Toe. Mm -hmm. uh, because all those curves, you can reuse them on any other platform. It makes sense to have a common core of all those curves that you can use then everywhere. And so even for Xamarin Forms, you can just copy and paste literally. You just change. So remember when I showed you there was different interface type mm -hmm. for all the different platform. That's pretty much the only thing you have to do. You just have to switch, change the name of the, which, uh, which interface you're implementing, maybe change the name of the method because they use slightly different naming. And there you go. You're set. You can re reuse exactly the same code. Yeah. Actually, we happened to see something in Charles Pitt's old session this morning that he uses some kind of animations through the Xamarin fonts. Mm -hmm. Is there any difference in the performance if you are using the Xamarin fonts animation versus a native? It's actually a good question. I do remember talking about Jason, uh, so the guy who created Xamarin forms. Uh, I do remember talking about him at the time. Uh, Jason's background is in that. Jason's background is in animation. Uh, before joining Xamarin, he was doing a lot of animation-related stuff. And so I think, I think the, what they kind of settled in is that I think they're implementing their own animation system. I think it's closer to Android. I think it runs on the main thread. Mm -hmm. It's not something like iOS. I mean, one of the reasons why iOS is more limited in a way it can do animation is that the way they implement animation is that they have a separate server, uh, a separate process on the system, uh, Windows Server, which does all of that for you. So because it's a different process, you don't have the same flexibility. It's not like you can pass a live object which implement any custom animation you want. And so instead, they're using those cubic, uh, cubic Beziers because that's easy to pass around. And also, I think in iOS, yeah, in, in iOS 7, in the latest version, they also let you use um, uh, spring, spring dampers. So this is like when you see when like um, something kind of goes fast and it kind of springs back into position. So they use that, I think, throughout the system. So that's why it's kind of the only type of animation you can do. But I think with Xamarin Forms, they went with that route too. It's a very flexible system. It runs on the main train or live in your application. And so you, I think you can also craft the same kind of movement. But it's really a good question to ask Jason. But I, I trust him. I'm sure, I'm sure he made something. Knowing him, how much he care about those performances of animation, I'm sure it's a good system. So uh, is it possible to uh, get uh, individual keyframes across the coded animations. So you, you have a time frame, obviously, between the start and the end. Can you say, I need uh, you know, the first quarter of a second, the second quarter of a second? You know, and, and can you get individual uh, you know, keyframes at, at, the, at the point that you specify? Uh, you mean like live in your app or? Yeah, live with code effectively. Yeah. Can you, you can, you can well, yeah, it. sure. Uh, I mean, one of, well, the way that comes to my mind is, um, you could just set up, um, you, you have a way to set up, uh, at least on Android, I'm sure other platforms probably have it, but you have a way to set up um, what, what is called a row animator, which is just synced on the animation clock. And so if you have that, you just set up that type of animator, keep in mind what time you want to stop the frames, and then when you reach that point where your row animator just stops all the other animation. And so on Android, it works by, you can just basically section, stop it in the way, anywhere, anywhere you want, and it's gonna keep that position. You can do the same with iOS. Um, it just, I think it's a parameter, you have to be careful, uh, that you can stop it and then it's gonna retain its, its, its position that it was in the middle. So this would make a great way to make a tool. Uh, this is what Brett Victor had, for instance. What he had is that during an animation, if you have a character jumping onto a platform, for instance, he was able to have all the individual keyframe of the jump, and that's how he was able to tune the entire movement. So this is something uh, I would definitely love to see in Sketch, for instance. Hi. Um, in iOS, you have uh, UI animated images. Uh, is there anything like that in Android? Image views. Sorry? Image views. Yeah. <laughs> same thing. You do. OK, thanks. You can also do uh, the same. You can do matrix transformation. You can do uh, anything you want to then animate those images, like change the clipping, change the bounds. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty. At the end of the day, all those guys, they just map to a, a GL, like an OpenGL texture. And so after that, you can do whatever you want.
All right, I think we're good. Thank you very much, guys.